Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guests today are Neil Kashkari and Ron Feldman. Neil is the president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank, and Ron is its first vice president and chief operating officer. Under their leadership, the Minneapolis Fed has spent the past few years working on a plan to end the too-big-to-fail problem. It is called the Minneapolis Plan, and its final version was recently released. Today, Neil and Ron join us to talk about the Minneapolis Plan as well as monetary policy. Neil and Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yep, great to be here. All right, Neil, I want to begin with you. Can you give us the uh, overview of the Minneapolis plan? Sure. When we started this initiative two years ago, we started by asking, have we really addressed the problem of too big to fail, or are the banks still too big to fail and taxpayers still at risk? So we convened the best experts in the world to give us their thoughts and brought that together in developing our plan. And the short answer is the biggest banks are still too big to fail. If they ran into trouble, like in 2008, taxpayers would have to step in and bail them out. We don't think that's acceptable. And the best way to address that is to make the banks issue a lot more equity capital, which is the buffer they hold to protect taxpayers in case of their own economic trouble. So basically, our analysis says that the biggest banks need about double the equity that they have today. And if they did that, that would more or less address the too big to fail problem. Now, the plan has many detailed components, increasing the capital requirements, forcing the Treasury Secretary to certify that the banks are no longer too big to fail, address risks in the shadow banking sector, and also reducing regulations in community banks. But if I were to boil it down, the biggest dozen or so banks in America need to have at least double the equity that they have today. And if we did that, that would improve the outcome for society and protect taxpayers. Great. So what what's the story behind the Minneapolis plan? I know Ron wrote a book early on, to, early 2004, I believe, on this topic, but you also worked with TARP. So how did this idea come together at the Minneapolis Fed? Well, I think you touched on it. So Ron Feldman and one of my predecessors, Gary Stern, wrote the original book, Too Big to Fail, in advance of the financial crisis, saying that the biggest banks are too big and that taxpayers are going to be on the hook, and they were exactly right. And then my role during the financial crisis, I was at Treasury overseeing the TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, where we use taxpayer money to bail out the banks. And that experience has burned into me. And so Ron and I, coming together at the Minneapolis Fed, we put our own experiences together, talked to other experts here in the bank and around the world, and that really drove this work that we've done, culminating in the release of our new plan. So recently on Twitter, I, I saw that you had mentioned you read Jesse Eisinger's book uh, about the – lack of prosecution for these executives at the big financial banks. I mean, how does that play into the story you're telling, well, if it does at all? Yeah, and that book, uh, to, the title of that book, which I find uh, amusing, is The Chicken Shit Club. And it's why prosecutors yep. are uh, afraid to prosecute big bank CEOs and executives. I think it plays into it because it adds to the lack of trust that Americans feel today. When I look at the political divide in our country, a lot of it, in my opinion, comes back to the financial crisis, the fact that you know, as a society, you've been taught that if you take a risk, you get the upside, but you also bear the consequences. And when the big banks got into trouble and we had to use taxpayer resources, that violated the fairness principle because the American people didn't cause this mess, but it was their money that had to go in to stabilize it. And then to add on top of that, the fact that it seems like senior executives who were in charge of institutions that got into trouble did not really face real consequences themselves. I think it magnifies the loss of trust that the American people feel about our economic system today. Now, I, I share your view. In fact, we've had him on the show. Um, one of the takeaways I got from the book, though, was that the regulators failed as much as these executives did. You know, the Department of Justice, the SEC. And I, one question I have related to what you're proposing, do you worry – that some of the failures of the regulators, um, the government officials who were supposed to implement you know, what regulations did exist prior to the crisis, that that might still be an issue even if your plan was passed? Well, actually, our plan is designed to assume that regulators are going to screw up in the future. Like w Regulators <laughs> okay. are nice. imperfect the way we all are. 
And we always uh-huh. seem to miss future financial crises. Financial crises have existed in all of recorded human history, and they will in the future. So let's start by assuming regulators are going to miss it. What do we need to do to make sure the financial system is strong so that the banks can't have enough capital so the taxpayers are not on the hook when the banks and the regulators miss it? That's actually what's motivating this plan. Well, very nice. I like that that angle because it is very sobering read, uh, Jesse's book. Yeah. Um, and again, I mentioned to our listeners, we, we've had him on a previous episode. So what is the next step? So you have this plan. You spend a lot of time working on it. Um, you mentioned in the report that you believe it needs to be implemented by Congress. So are you pitching it to Congress? Well, I've met with many uh, representatives, Senate and House, Republican and Democrat. And almost everyone I meet with agrees that the biggest banks – are too big to fail. We need to address it, and we need to ra- relax regulations on community banks. So I feel like there is a broad consensus around the central thrust of the Minneapolis plan. Now, just because everybody agrees with an issue, or most people agree, does not necessarily mean it's they're actually going to take action. And we know the political winds are blowing against us right now, and the Federal Reserve does not lobby. You know, we're not allowed to lobby. It's not appropriate for us. Sure. So what we're trying to do is arm legislators with the best analysis available so that they can make the best possible decisions. And whether they take action now or at some point in the future, we want to make sure that this analysis is there and available to support them when the time is right. Yeah, so Congress is the best solution, but I'm wondering if there's anything you could do through the Federal Reserve System itself, since the Fed is one of the biggest regulators. Is there any discussion you're having with other Federal Reserve officials, any talk of maybe you know, trying to raise capital levels through Fed regulation? Well, it's something that I talk about quite a bit, and I think that there's a wide range of opinions within the Federal Reserve System. So I'm not in a position to predict what the Federal Reserve System will do going forward. Uh, But I do think uh, it's important for Congress to act. You know, when I look at Dodd-Frank, the the fundamental tenet of Dodd-Frank was do not change, do not restructure the financial system. I don't agree with that fundamental tenet. But I understand why Congress came to that conclusion in 2010, because we're still crawling into the Great Recession. I think people were afraid of doing anything too dramatic to the financial system at that time. And so Fed is implementing regulations that Congress has built the framework around. And that's, I think, now is the right time. The economy is much stronger than it was in 2010. Now is the right time to go further to address too big a deal once and for all before we forget how painful the early crisis was. Yeah. We'll be interesting to see how that goes. It, it does seem, at least my impression, is that you know, both the left and the right understand the key, I think, argument of your plan is that there needs to be higher levels of, of capital funding for banks. And people disagree on the details and the plans, but I think most people appreciate that point. Is that your sense as well? I do think so, yes. And it's very simple. You know, when I – an analogy that I use, when I bought a house, my wife and I moved to Minnesota a couple of years ago. We bought a house. The bank made us put 20 percent down in our house. The reason we had to put 20% down was to protect the bank in case we ran into financial trouble. Well, it's simple. If we make the biggest banks put around 20% down on their own investments, we can protect taxpayers. And it's not more complicated than that. Well, we'll come back to the Minneapolis plan in in a few minutes. I want to discuss it with Ron in more detail. But I want to move on while I still have you and talk about monetary policy. You're a very colorful individual for those of us who follow the FOMC. I'm a part of FOMC Twitter. I love reading your tweets. And I love the fact that you have a medium post. I love the increased transparency. Um, and maybe it's confirmation bias, but I like your views as well. But with that said, um, dying to ask you, what is your take on the persistently low inflation? It's been below the 2% target for some time. A lot of Fed officials have been puzzled by it. There's mysteries. There's the conundrum. Lots of articles with this bewilderment you know, story being told. What is your take on what's happening? Well, I agree with your characterization. There are lots of explanations and a lot of head scratching. If I were to boil it down into one factor that I think is probably most important, it's inflation expectations are lower than we appreciate, and that's the Fed's own doing. I think we've learned over the last 30 years how important the role of expectations are in shaping inflation outcomes. And for the last five or six years, in my opinion, the FOMC has been treating our 2% inflation target as a ceiling. Every time inflation starts looking like it's creeping up, 
the Fed is there to run and say, no, we're going to keep inflation in check. And so I think the Fed's own actions have been leading to a hardening of inflation expectations at somewhat below 2%. And that then results in actual inflation being below our 2% target. And so I think it's of our own making. So that's why you want to be more cautious moving forward with the rate hikes, which makes complete sense to me. Um, you know, the Atlanta Fed did a survey I found interesting of, of small businesses, and, and the survey disclosed that the small businesses viewed 2% as a ceiling, not as some kind of some average point. Um, l- let me take that point and, and move to a, a conversation that's been had a lot lately, and that is this idea of getting a new framework for monetary policy. So there's been a lot of recent conferences, the Brookings Institution, the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I was at the American Economic Association. There was a nice session there on the future of monetary policy. And there's been a lot of discussion about a new framework, a new maybe approach to monetary policy. Some of, some of the examples are, that have been laid out, higher inflation target, or maybe just the same inflation target, but maybe have a 1% to 3% range, so there's, there's no asymmetry. There's also discussion of a price level target. Ben Bernanke suggested one recently. And then my personal favorite is nominal GDP level targeting. But I'd love to hear what are your thoughts on these discussions? I think the discussions are interesting intellectual and academic arguments, but I'm not, I don't think they're very realistic. You know, when I travel around my district and I talk about the Fed's current framework, I get a lot of pushback on our 2% target. I can only imagine the outcry if we were to try to raise it to 3% or 4%. Number one. Number two, so far, we can't even hit our 2% target. So if we announce a higher target, 3% or 4% or base level target, it isn't obvious to me why anybody would believe us or should believe us. Yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, you need credibility for the current tar- target before you move on to the next one. And I, I think um, you know, Frederick Mishkin at this most recent conference, I believe it was at the Brookings, he suggested, look, let's stick with our target, but let's make it credible. Let's, you know, kind of the one to three point, let's set a, maybe a range around it so we're not afraid to overshoot sometimes as well as undershoot. So first get the one we have credible before we move on. Well, here's the thought I had. I, I wonder if you know, Fed officials, maybe unconsciously, maybe consciously, are worried about uh, going above two. They're, they're afraid they'll be grilled by Congress, by the public. So if you came out and explicitly said, hey, we're going to go anywhere between one and three, so you kind of create the expectation that it's okay to get 2.5, 2.4, you know, that there's there's some going to be some give and take. If you just set, kind of set the kind of the barriers on the road between one and three, do you think that would help? Maybe. no Nobody that I know of is who's uh, advocating for interest rate increases is pointing to that as their reason. They're okay. saying things like, well, the unemployment rate is getting too low and I'm getting nervous. I don't see how a too low unemployment rate is not equally a problem in a 3 or 4% inflation target. Okay. Well, let me uh, move on to another issue that's kind of hot at the Fed right now, a hot topic, and that is the balance sheet reduction. The FOMC has been very clear. I think it's been very careful and clear and designating what it's going to do, I think that's great. You guys signaled, you know, well in advance, so there's no taper tantrum this time. Excellent job. But one thing that's been left unclear is where it will end up, and where it ends up, of course, has implications for whether the Fed ultimately sticks with its floor system or it moves to more like a corridor system like Canada has. Do you have any preferences or views on that topic? Well, I think we haven't decided yet how small a balance sheet we want to return to. And I think there are advantages to both a corridor system and a floor system. And obviously, the Fed had a corridor system for most of its history up until recently uh, when we adopted Mm -hmm. the floor system around QE. Uh, We think on the margin, a floor system is somewhat uh, easier in terms of operational complexity, a little lower complexity. And I also see an advantage that if we are in a low R-star environment, where we could be hitting the zero lower bound more frequently, and we might have to turn to QE in future downturns, then if we're already in the floor system, admittedly with a smaller balance sheet, maybe it's somewhat easier to then ramp up QE as opposed to having to shift from corridor system to a floor system in the future. So on the margin, I think there are some benefits to a floor system, but I, I see advantages both ways. In the last few minutes I have with you, Neil, I, I'm, I've got to ask about your use of Medium to explain your FOMC decisions. It's been a refreshing change to have an FOMC official come out and, and explain, you know, why they did what they did. Um, and also, you know, using Medium's kind of hip. You've definitely reached the uh, millennial generation. 
So how did you come about using a medium and thinking about, you know, ex- explaining your decision on it? Well, it's something I've wrestled with because there's always uh, a desire for more transparency. People want to understand our decision making. And at the same time, people criticize the Fed saying there are too many Fed speakers and there's a cacophony of views and it just adds to noise and confusion. So I was trying to think of a way to enhance transparency without adding noise. And what I came up with was, let me do, after I cast a vote, let me explain, looking backwards, here's the data and analysis I looked at to reach my conclusion. It was a way to enhance transparency, but because it's backward looking entirely, it shouldn't add any noise forward. And I feel like it's doing that. You know, I've gotten a lot of good feedback that my medium posts are transparent, very clear, and they're also mm-hmm. not adding noise. So I'm happy about the book to keep it up. Yeah, so... At the FOMC, do you do you get feedback from your fellow members there? Like, hey, that's that's a great idea. Now, maybe I should try it. Well, trying to lead by example, but leading by example implies that somebody's following. And so I haven't seen others come out, either Twitter or own medium posts explaining their votes on the FOMC. So not yet, but um, full in the future. Oh, that would be great. Uh, I think it's very insightful. It's, it's useful. And, and I... I appreciate your engagement on Twitter because I know a lot of times you get flack from people who believe the Fed is out to destroy the world or the Fed's artificially lowering rates or the Fed is the reason for all the bubbles. And you patiently engage, which um, is amazing. So uh, appreciate all that you're doing and, and kind of this kind of refreshing, putting a refreshing new face on the FOMC. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Thank you. All right. I want to move to Ron. I want to talk a little bit more about the Minneapolis plan. And let's let's begin by asking this question, Ron, since you have a whole book on this from 2004 you wrote with Gary Stern, Too Big to Fail, The Hazards of Bank Bailouts. How did we get to this place to begin with? How did we get to a too big to fail that seems to be persistent to our banking system? Well, that's that's a good question. Um, and, you know, Maybe I'll take a step back, David, and, and try okay. to think a little bit about what do we mean when we say too big to fail? Because you know, I've, there's been a, even a bit of an evolution in my thinking you know, over the last 20 years that I've worked on this issue. So I think historically, what was the problem? What were people concerned about? So people were concerned that because the government was um, both explicitly through things like deposit insurance, but also implicitly were protecting the creditors of large banks. And so the concern was that these creditors who normally would be trying to price the riskiness of a bank no longer had that incentive because they were going to be protected no matter what. And so what people were worried about is sort of the classic moral hazard problem. So if there's not pricing of risk at banks, banks don't get the right signals about how much risk they're taking. They take on more risk than they would otherwise, and then they end up uh, getting in trouble and getting bailed out. But when you think about it in that framework, the problem isn't really so much the bailout. The problem is all the prior decisions that banks made that were basically poor uses of resources. So that was the problem that I think people at Minneapolis Fed were worried about, and and before I got here too, they've been worried about that for years and years. Um, and so that's so that was the too big to fail problem. So again, the problem is, well, we need to not protect these creditors because then they'll give the right signals, then banks will take on less risk, they won't get bailed out. But more importantly, you won't have thousands and thousands of, let's say, multifamily apartment buildings, you know, standing vacant in Miami or something like that. Okay. So that's that's one definition of the problem. Then there's a sort of second definition that people have, which is, look, I don't really think, and let me say, so these two camps, um, you know, sometimes would argue with each other. So the first camp, sometimes people would call these like moral hazard absolutists or some things like that. So the uh-huh. second camp says, look, that's not the problem. The problem isn't that bankers are going out there and taking on more risks uh, only because, you know, they wouldn't do it if they had to pay 4% on their bonds, but instead they're paying 2% on the bonds. And so that's the problem. They're, they're saying the problem is sort of a classic externality problem. So if I'm running a big bank, I don't think about what happens if when my bank fails. But when my bank fails, that can lead other banks to fail, and it can lead corporations to not get funding, and the end result is sort of a reduction in GDP. And so the problem is this externality. And, um, and, and what we need to do is try to figure out how to price in that externality, and then banks would sort of operate in a more effective way. So they're not, they're not worried about necessarily this moral hazard issue. They're just worried about the problem being 
banks are going to get, let's say, too big or too complicated or whatever it is. And when they fail, they're worried about the spillovers that are going to occur. Anyway, so those are the two. So how did we get there? I mean, I think the basic point is one view is that we got there because the government was sort of guaranteeing stuff. The other view was sort of, well, no, what happened was firms just got more complicated over time. They got bigger over time. And when they got into trouble, there was a more of a ripple effect on everybody else. Both sides basically propose almost the exact same kind of reforms. So anyway, that's how we got to the current situation where banks got more complicated. Because they got more complicated, people were worried about them getting in trouble. Because when they got into trouble, that led to big problems. They got bailed out. So, you know, you could say both sides were kind of right. Well, that's interesting. So you have the moral hazard absolutist, and then you got the kind of spillover story from having a large institution. It, it seems like those two could be interconnected, right? Yeah. In fact, in, in the book, we tried to argue that they were basically connected. So why, okay. the way we said it was, well, look, why do policymakers want to bail out banks? Uh, there's different views. I mean, some people view it as sort of political economy. You know, they're trying to help their friends. Mm -hmm. Some people... Um, you know, have got sort of that kind of take on it. Our take was, if you're a policymaker and you are worried that if a large bank fails, other banks are going to fail, you have basically another great depression on your hand or a great recession on your hand, you're going to try to engage and prevent it. And so that's the connection. Since people know you're going to do that, then they know that they're going to get protected. So therefore, they've got an incentive to take on too much risk. So in our mind, they're sort of, they're interrelated. But I guess what's the point of bringing up this history here? It's um, it doesn't really matter if you think there's a lot of moral hazard or not. You're going to end up making the same kind of recommendations as if you did think there was a lot of moral hazard. So just to be clear, what I was, had in mind is that you have the moral hazard story, which there may be some truth to it. Does that is there any evidence that that has encouraged banks to get bigger? Not just to take on more risk, but to, to expand. Or maybe let me phrase the question this way: Why have banks become so large and so concentrated um, outside of a moral hazard story? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a scale story that some people have, right? Which is, if you think about credit card lending, or if you think about asset management, or if you think about even consumer lending, a lot of that business is really you know getting a computer, programming the computer, and then. That taking advantages of the scale that you have in, okay. in managing those accounts. So that would lead firms to get bigger, separate from anything else we've done. And, and in fact, if you look at the question is whether the very, very large banks in the US, you know, they add scale and way up to scale. I think there's a reasonable debate about whether about, about whether banks that big are exploiting scale or whether it, it would get exploited at a much smaller scale. Let me move on and talk about your capital requirements. So the Minneapolis plan um, calls for capital or common equity being at the level of 23.5%. So explain that to our listeners. What does that mean? Sure. So we would require banks to um, to fund themselves with, with uh, equity that would equal to 23.5% of their risk-weighted assets. And risk-weighted assets means if you there's a, a bigger weight that's put on something, an asset that's risky, and a lower weight that's put on something that's safe, like a treasury bill. Okay. And where is it currently at? Is there an average? Yeah. So the, there's two separate issues. There's what, what banks actually hold, and there's – so our number, the 23 and a half, is like a requirement. So it's separate from what they actually hold. It would be the rule that would be their minimum amount. It ends up, David, that the U.S. capital system is about the most convoluted, complicated – thing that exists and so it's sort of saying what the minimum level right now for the large banks is it's really hard there's the minimum level then there's a bunch of buffers that can change over time then there's a surcharge and that gets recalculated depending on what assets you hold so it's it's really hard i mean what we did was to avoid all this complexity we said the current number the current minimum number is 13 percent so why did we do that so if you look at a point in time um at a time, Federal Reserve was issuing a rule that affected what the capital returns were going to be. They said at that point, JPMC was the largest bank at the time that had a minimum level of 13. And so that's actually a pretty conservative number. The actual minimum capital requirements is going to be lower than that. But we thought we basically give more credit to the current regime so that we can compare the current regime to what we're proposing. It would make the, more, would make the current regime seem more favorable. Okay. So, but I, I think that's why I think we meant to talk to Neil. Said we're sort of roughly doubling it. 
Okay, roughly doubling it. And you guys in the paper show um, that this would dramatically reduce the probability of a systemic crisis, correct? Yes. Yeah, it would, it would get it down from like 70 to like closer to 40. That, that this one step. So where does 23 and a half come from? So we actually um, go ahead and we try to estimate the cost and benefits of additional capital. And I can talk about sort of roughly how we do that. And when you do that, you're maximizing net benefits at 22%. Okay, so why not 22? Well, we picked 23 and a half because the Federal Reserve had a proposal how much loss absorbing capacity, is what they called it, for the largest banks. So that's equity plus a special kind of debt. And that would have been 23 and a half for JPMC. So since we had 22 and they had basically said 23, it was like three and a half, it's like the right amount. We just said 20 and a half. And just to be clear, under the Minneapolis plan, this capital requirement of 23.5% applies to banks only with assets over $250 billion, correct? correct. And then the, the other steps, and Neil mentioned these earlier, but just so our listeners are aware and have them in their mind, you've got to raise capital of 23.5% for, for banks over $250 billion. Second, uh, the Treasury Secretary would have to certify, there's a five-year process or five-year deadline that, where they have to process, uh, certify whether this bank is systematically important or not, too big to fail or not. And if if they are not, so if they're okay, they don't pose a systematic risk, they stick at the 23.5. But if they are someone who is systematically important, then you guys have a, this kind of scale where it, the capital requirement actually goes up until it hits 38%. Is that right? That's exactly, That's exactly right. And 38% is the point at which if you went higher, you would no longer have net benefits. So that's where that's coming from. Okay. So for banks that pose a particularly strong risk to the entire economy, they would have to fund with even more capital. Exactly. And then the third step is you would also move into the shadow banking area because, as we saw during the crisis, there was a run on the shadow banks. And you guys want to make sure that, you know, that, that if you were put these capital requirements on regular banks that the you know the behavior the the, the highly leveraged um, financial intermediation doesn't shift over into shadow banking okay. so over there you the plan as I understand it is you put a 1.2 percent tax on shadow banks if they are not systematically important and if they are then it's 2.2 percent on leveraged yeah that's a, that, that's exactly right you did your okay in fact you're uh, you've shown that you've read it and that we were at least somewhat clear because you're describing it correctly. Good. All right. And, and so what this is, again, this is for, you know, banks over $250 billion in assets. And then just one detail left out for your shadow banks. It had, they had $50 billion in assets. And then your fourth part then is for community banks, which is to reduce the unnecessary regulations. I'm not going to worry too much about that part, component in our conversation. So I want to focus more on, on the, the, the main goal, which is to eliminate too big to fail. So can, can, can I say one quick thing on the community bank sure. part? I mean, I, I do think it's it's relevant in the following sense. So for years and years, you've had now policymakers across um, political ideology saying that they think they're, the burden on community banks is sort of out of whack. But there's been really very, very little actual work done. So why is that? Because I mean, our sense is because People are worried that if you start making changes to these small banks, you're going to get changes also made to the largest institutions that favor them. And since they're worried, as Neil said, that the biggest banks are still too big to fail, the last thing they want to do is do anything that could relax the rules on the largest banks. And so our take is the reason why you haven't had progress for the community banks is because people are still worried about the large banks. So the idea would be you, you uh, move forward with our plan, that would address the large bank problem, and then it would free you up to get rid of rules of the small banks that really are not value-added. One of the comments I saw in your report, which is nice, you, you replied to all the comments, I guess, from the first draft of your report. One of them spoke to this question of why don't you um, apply these increased capital requirements based on the type of economic activity rather than the size of the bank? Um and I'm wondering, is, is this community bank kind of addressing this community community bank distinction? Is that kind of address that question? Uh, a little bit. I, mean, I, I think it gets to the fact that when you asked me what the current minimum capital requirement is for large banks, I, I was it was difficult for me to say it's six. I mean, I think as a general approach for the whole entire endeavor, 
we just tried to stick with things that are that are simple to implement. And okay. so, so that's that's one answer. The second answer is we actually are incorporating what banks are doing in that second stage that you noted. So the Treasury Department is going to have to figure out are banks still posing a systemic risk? And there's a framework that that's already out there that we suggest they follow. It looks really specifically are what are the activities of the banks involved? So. So I think the I think the question, the claim that we're not really looking at what banks are doing, I mean, it's true for the 23 and a half, the straight up asset test, but really uh, this other part of it, which is determine whether or not they're systemically important, that's going to be looking precisely at what they're doing. Now, the Treasury Secretary has is the individual that will certify whether a bank is too big to fail and gets the additional capital um, requirements, and you give them a five-year deadline. So one of the questions that, that hit me as I was reading that is, how do you make that credible? Are, are there any concerns you might have that they might keep kicking the can down the road and pass that five-year deadline? I mean, so of course, that's, it's, it's always true, right? I mean, I think that's it. I, I would say in the history of these sort of capital rules, at least the ones I've seen, they almost are always transitioned in. And I think to date, they've largely been executed. But, you know, clearly if you get um, – an administration, for example, in one regime, and then you know, four years later, you get another one. They can have different views on it. Um, yeah. but, but I think that's one reason really why we want this to not be done through regulation, but we want it to be done through law. So then I think there are there are means to try to force people to obey the law. Okay. Now, your report also mentioned that there are some facets of Dodd Frank you would keep. Um, you mentioned like the resolutions in the paper. So the living wills, I think the orderly liquidation authority, are, are those parts of Dodd-Frank you would keep? Yeah, I mean, basically we're, we're keeping everything except for the capital rules and the rules associated with this um, loss absorbing. So maybe can I spend 30 seconds on that, what, sure, what, our, what the issue is? So under the Federal Reserve's current proposal, and this is really the linchpin of how we're going to solve too big to fail allegedly under the current regime, uh, banks are going to uh, fund themselves with equity, but they're also going to fund themselves with some debt. And the debt is going to be uh, explicitly used for the purposes of recapitalizing the institution. So the bank fails. Uh, you're going to be, instead of having to determine how to put more money into the bank, they're going to convert these debt holders into equity holders of a future entity. And that's how they're going to avoid putting, putting more money in. It's these debt holders. So our fundamental view is that's not going to work. It, we've tried actually we've tried something almost exactly like this. Or it didn't work during the financial crisis. They've tried things like this in Europe right now. It hasn't worked. And we think that it's not going to work going forward. So, so we don't follow that part of the current regime. All the other aspects of the current regime are basically in, in line for the largest banks. Yeah, I'm curious about the orderly liquidation authority in particular. I've had some guests on the show who worry about that part of Dodd-Frank. They take essentially a, a moral hazard argument. If these big banks know that at the end of the day, if push comes to shove, they need to be bailed out, this orderly liquidation authority will come in and, and, and you know take over for them. And I guess the counter argument would be, well, it's going to happen. If it's going to happen, Miles will try to make it systematic. What are your thoughts on that? Is, is there a, is this moral hazard concern warranted or not? So I think it, it actually circles back to the very first um, part of our discussion, and that's why I, I tried to talk a little bit about that. So you know, in the book that Gary and I wrote, and then the work we're doing now, it's not um, the existence of a fund that lets you do a resolution that creates the problem. The problem is that when these institutions get into trouble, they, through a lot of different means, can have uh, spillover effects on other institutions and the real economy. That's what's driving policymakers to bail people out. So, you know, creating the order of liquidation fund, that's that's just recognizing what the truth of the matter is. Um, now, you may make the argument that you guys are putting in so much capital, you're never going to need to use it. I mean, our take is, you know, People put in a dike to block a flood. You block the 100 year flood, and suddenly in a new world, you find out that the 100 year flood is really the 50 year flood. So you need to have something you're going to do. But I'm, I, I, I personally have never believed that the reason why we have a problem here is because we have these tools that are going to be used to address it if it's a problem. I think the reason we have people believe they're going to get bailed out is because they know that the complexity and the connections of these firms, if they get in trouble, there's going to be a reason to bail them out. 
So what we're trying to do is put equity in there to, to guard against that. And I think that's the best thing we can do. Okay. I think there's much agreement on that point. I want to turn to some ideas that have been brought up by past guests. Uh, I mentioned that the order liquidation authority is a past concern, but there's been other suggestions as well. Different ways of addressing too big to fail, making our banking system safer. And I want to just throw some of them out there and then get your response to them. Let me start with COCOs or, or debt that can be turned into equity during a crisis. What are your thoughts on those? Right. So we cover, tried to cover that a little bit. So COCOs are very much like this quote unquote bail in debt that I mentioned, this debt that you're going to issue. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're not. There, there's some important conceptual differences, but fundamentally the idea is a firm's going to get into trouble. There's going to be existing instruments that can become capital. And I think you just need to look at what happened with uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, so this was in a prior regime. They, people were, used to talk about what was called subordinated debt. But it's the same idea. that They would be forced to issue debt. That debt would, would be very junior, so it would get converted, and there would be a problem. Now, flash forward, you're in a crisis, and what people are worried about is, am I going to lose my money? So you're in the middle of a crisis, and you're telling me that the solution to making people feel comfortable um, not freaking everybody out is you're going to impose more losses on more people. I mean, it just seems implausible. And the only creditor where in the U.S. we have a record that we do impose losses on them is equity. I mean, we do treat equity holders different than fixed income holders, you know, depositor or, or bondholders. So I think COVOs and bail in debt, I think it's very elegant. And if it worked, I would I think that would be great. But we have record of it here. And I should just add, in Italy and Europe and other places, they're using the same idea. And so just last year, they were confronted with this issue. What are they going to do about the bail in debt of the Italian banks that were in trouble? And they said, well, you know, it's a special exception. We're going to need to protect those folks. So I think that's the history. I mean, you talk about this, the five-year delay credible. The thing that's not is that in a crisis, a government's going to want to impose more losses on debt holders. Has it happened? Not going to happen. So even if you're very clear up front, say hey, these things will turn to equity in the midst of a crisis, people still think, no, you won't. Um, the nature of a whole big bail problem is that it's an implicit guarantee. I mean, this goes back to you know, 30, 40 years for uninsured. I mean, they're called uninsured depositors. And then what happens? They get protected. So, I, yeah. you know, just... Just I mean, that's another solution people will say. Well, pass a constitutional amendment that says you can't bail people out. Pass a law that says you can't bail people out. People are bailing people out because they want to help people. They want to like help their friends or they want to get around the law. Doing it because they think when I look at the cost benefits, I don't want to be the senator, congressman, president who, who over increased the next super group. I don't want to be the person that goes out of history, whether it's right or wrong, that I created a pressure. Let's move to another proposal then. John carquin has been on the show, and he's written about this a lot. He wants to go to 100% equity financing. So he wants to take your proposal and go all the way up. So he would have, for example, a person take out their debit card, and that debit card is backed by assets that are constantly changing in value. And he argues, look, we've got the technology for it now. It's not a big deal. Um, I also had David Andel Fado from the St. Louis Fed on the show, and he he had a great reply, an amusing one. I, I thought I thought was funny. He said, "Look, that turns your debit card into a you know a lottery machine in Vegas. You don't know for sure, you know, from one day to the next." I think John Conkern might say it might be a little more stable than a than a you know a slot machine in Vegas. But what are your thoughts on a hundred percent equity funding? Yeah, I mean, I, I think David's getting at sort of the point. Now, I guess I have a two-part answer. So in the current world and current technology, going to 100% equity funding for banks, it's it's um, it, it's interesting to see that banks aren't doing that themselves. And what do I mean by that? So, you know, if you go back and look over time and across countries, you'll see that banks fund themselves with something that looks like a deposit. I mean, this goes way back to like historical records, I think, from the Phoenician period. And there's, you know, periods in Venice where that's what banks fund themselves. So there's something that markets want delivered by having an institution fund itself with something that looks like a deposit and issue that looks like a loan. So given that that's how markets seem to operate, saying that we're going to require everyone to be equity finance 100% implies that there's some big market um, demand that we're going to meet. So what John is positing is that, well, it's currently, saying it's currently, but in some future world, this demand that markets have that looks like a deposit can actually be met with equity. But, you know, I'd certainly, at that point, the open to it, it's interesting is someone could do that, 
you know, it'd be interesting if markets would deliver that themselves. But right now, I'm sure we're David I don't think the technology is important, and I think it sort of runs counter to some big um, market demand. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. People want, for better or for worse, they want fixed nominal price securities deposits. And uh, and your point is, until that demand changes, don't expect 100% equity financing to take over the world. Yeah, and I do think I take a lot from the fact that it's cross-country, cross-time. I mean, this isn't I mean, this isn't a uniquely American thing. It's human nature. <laughs> we, <Yeah>. want, <laughs> we want it, so we'll get it. Okay, let me st- throw another proposal out. Uh, Norbert Michel was on the show, and he edited a volume where some of the authors – wanted to go back to double, triple liability for bank shareholders. So you would get rid of limited liability. Um, Historically, apparently, this was the case up until about the Great Depression. So you had skin in the game. And the argument is that if the shareholders had skin in the game, it would better incentivize them to fund with enough capital. Yeah. Um, What what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, there was some work that was done here at the Minneapolis Fed on that double liability thing. If I remember correctly, it actually did not work out that well at the time that it was instituted. So I think there were lots of bad, there were lots of financial crises and banking panics that were associated with double liability. Um, So I'm not quite sure the historical record. Not not quite the the demand to bring something back that maybe didn't work in its prior incarnation. I don't know. That doesn't seem that strong. Well, I've seen a few papers that argue it worked okay, but the FDIC basically wiped it out. It was well. I think the FDIC I think, came along. I think you've got a couple of colleagues, right? I think I think you wrote something about Scotland that had been used there too. Right? Yeah, and I think also Josh Henderson. I think it's counter papers. Is what I'm saying. I think I think that I think it's a big problem for the next discussion. And I'm not trying to throw up a smoke screen at you to say, yeah. to say, but I think the historical record isn't entirely. I think the second thing would be, I mean, there's other ways that you can get um, people with skin. I mean, so our own is a version of that, right? I mean, you're going to have equity holders. That's the whole point, right? That they're going to have some skin in the game. No, absolutely. I I think both of these approaches would ultimately lead to more skin in the game. All right, let me move on to another guest I had on the show, Morgan Ricks. I don't know if you've seen his book, but his proposal as it relates to our conversation today is that any institution that issues money like you know liabilities, whether it's a traditional bank or a shadow bank, would only do so if they you know, fell under a certain form of uh, of institution. They'd have to, I guess, incorporate into a, a certain type of money lending institution, and they would all be backed up by FDIC. So basically, extend FDIC to any institution that that issues any kind of money like liability. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, one thing I like about this proposal is it's transparency because I mean, it there's two ways of getting at what we're trying to return. So one one way would um, one way would be what we're saying, which is, hey, you ought to impose a cost now that's going to absorb the losses and that's going to prevent people from having concern when their bank gets into trouble. Another way is the complete opposite, which is to say, we're going to the government much more out there. They're going to guarantee more things. And because they're guaranteeing more things, then there's less of a concern when the institution gets into trouble because there's less ways that the problem can spread from one institution to another. There's not going to be funds because everybody's guaranteed. And that's exactly what Morgan's proposing, but it's along those lines. Um, so it, the question there is uh, sort of the trick you want to make. I mean, if you've got, any, if you've got a much bigger government guarantee, then this issue of hazard seems like it's much more present. So I, I, I think that's a trade-off. But I do like the idea that it's, that it, it's uh, transparent, and I think it would largely work. But the, but the, the question is, what kind of cost would it help us? Yes, yes. Okay, last um, alternative proposal by a guest, J.P. Koning. He's a blogger I had on the show. He has mentioned that in the past, central banks opened up their balance sheets to everyone. He gave the example, in particular, of the Bank of England. It used to be the case people could actually, you know, have a checking account directly at the Bank of England. That kind of got phased out, and then eventually, just the employees had checking accounts at the Bank of England, and then that finally got phased out um, recently. But the idea is, if you had a checking account at the central bank, it would be the safest. You know, account in the world. Um, J.P. Coning recognizes that it was st- that you know what would this do to financial intermediation elsewhere in the economy? That that'd be the big pushback. 
well, what happened to banks? And his argument is, well, those banks would still exist. They would provide services the central bank doesn't provide. But what are your thoughts on opening up the Fed's balance sheet just to anyone? So I hadn't actually heard that before. <laughs> so um, It's radical. It's very radical. I mean, well, I mean, I guess it's another version of the 100% guarantee, right? Which is that, you know, people yep. have the people, people want these, uh, something that looks like a deposit. Uh, if they're worried about the condition of their bank, they're going to run. And it's those runs that leads to this instability. So one idea would be, so again, our idea is, well, let's make the bank, make it very hard for the bank to get in trouble because the equity is going to it. There's this other school of thought, I think, what Morgan's proposal is in the version of this proposal, which says, well, no, just have the deposits provided in a really, really safe way. Um, so, I, you know, I just talked about it, the insurance concern, you have a lot of moral concerns. And here, you, I mean, they articulate, I'm not, so what is the central bank? And if the central bank is just going to hold assets, so, I mean, I'm, central bank becomes a huge money market account, kind of, and I'm, you know, to do which getting back to what we talked about before, that there's something about the combination of deposits with risky assets, long term risky assets, and that's a useful combination. You know, if you think that's useful, you can banks provide market service. It's not really a this is a great idea. No, yeah, I'm not comfortable with the idea. It's it's an interesting one. I see its appeal because it would be super safe. But I do worry about the larger footprint the Fed would have in the financial system if they did something like that. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm yeah. it in, in the other way around, right? I mean, it's we're saying the same thing. It's less that I'm worried about the Fed's footprint per se. It's more that banks provide a useful service. It seems like it's linked to deposit taking and making loans. Before we try to destroy that through policy, I think really carefully about what the implications are going to be because banks make lots of loans to people who can't get funding otherwise. And mm-hmm. And that's a really key part of the economy. But that's the whole reason for worrying about financial crises is that banks get into trouble and they stop making the loans they were making before. And so if, if we're going to have a policy that basically emasculates banks completely, then I don't, you know, we have to have a real conflict that that's not going to destroy a lot of lending that's very productive, which I don't know. I, I completely don't. agree with yeah. that. I completely agree with that. I, I think that's, that was JP's reply is there's, Banks would still do that, but I'm not, it's not clear to me that that would, that would work out. Like you said, it might emasculate banks. But also, I, 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 the other concern I would have with that approach is that you would end up like some of these banks in China. Just <clears throat> If the Fed did get in the business of making loans to regular people, it's not clear to me they would do a very good job. There'd be corruption. There'd be all kinds of issues that would emerge. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think so. – I've never met anyone in my entire career at the Federal Reserve ever say that they're interested in that business. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so there's not uh, no demand from the Fed to do that. The Fed would be even less popular than it, it, it is no, at yeah, times. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> well, let's go back to your plan, the Minneapolis plan. You spent several years on this. I imagine you're one of the key you know, architects of it since you've been working on these issues for a long time. Where do you see it going? I know I talked to Neil about this earlier, but do you see, in, in addition to you know conversation, are there more conferences lined up? Are you, you know, commissioning more research on this? What, what do you see happening next? Yeah, I mean, we did. I don't think we're going to do anything in the short term. I mean, I don't think this year. I can't imagine us uh, having a conference on it. I think we're going to try, you know, try to talk to people what we're doing, and I think we're going to try to see where the environment goes. I mean, I'll just again speak for myself clearly. You know, it's one thing to stay with the current regime, which we're not in favor of, and which we think has got a lot of problems. It would be even worse in my mind to sort of try to roll back, like I mean, maybe have banks hold even less capital. I mean, I think that would be disastrous and really. Um, Really disappointing. I mean, I was hoping it would take at least twenty years to forget the worst, <laughs> the worst financial <laughs> crisis of depression. So to forget with a decade is is, right. is is discouraging. But anyway, I, mean, I, I think we're going to look to where uh, people are moving and try to talk to people who are interested in it. But I don't think we're going to be um, trying to convene people or, or do something like that unless there's interest. I mean, you know, I think we've been clear about where we're at and at some point you have to let the market respond to whether there's interest in your proposal. Okay. Well, that is very interesting. It's been a fun conversation with Neil Kashkari and Ron Feldman. Ron, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for asking us. We got a chance to geek out here a little bit, so that was good. Thanks. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.